Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Here's to Life. I'm Nick Barada, and today we have Mr. Max Siegelman, the founder of Siegelman Stable with us. Um, my guy, I'm very, very excited to be here. Thanks for having us. I'm hyped to be here. I'm happy yeah. to have you here. Yeah, I'm, uh, we're, we're in New York City. We're at, we're at your office space here in Midtown. Um, you know, I've been here once before. I had to do a little shopping, man. I, I think I'm up to like six or seven hats at this point. Good number to start That's not bad, right? Not we're a bad okay. Start. Yeah. yeah. I've so, seen a lot more, though. Yeah. There's I get some... DMs on Instagram, like almost 100 hats. Some of these people. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I got, a, I got a long way to go, but <laughs> we'll leave with some stuff today, too, for sure. Um, man, what a crazy few years it's been for you. Um, it's been wild. Wild, wild few years. Uh, we only met, I don't know, six or seven months ago at this point, mm -hmm. and just watching you through social and, and um, you know, obviously hanging out a little bit and seeing you at the, in these events, man. I'm just super proud of you, man. Like, like it's been such an honor to watch you operate and do your thing, man. It's, it's, it's been uh, uh, truly like inspiring, for real. I appreciate yeah. it. And we met in the best way possible. Yep. Got a little sweat in together. Yep, yep. You're, you're, you're big into, into health and wellness. And, you know, uh, I'm not as big of a runner as you are. But we were just kind of talking about that. How important is health and wellness? And how did that play a role in, uh, in, in kind of your, your whole brand? Yeah, I mean, I think every day I need to do something. I mean, the first thing I do most days is go for a run and lift. Yeah. So I just think like for me, it's just getting into that uh, routine is big for me. I played soccer my entire life through college. Mm -hmm. So you kind of get in that pattern and stick in that routine. Uh, and I'm definitely a routine person. So I, other than that, it's just good for you, for yeah. your mental health, physical health. Uh, I said this year, or I actually said last year, it's 2024, 2023. I said one of my biggest focuses was gonna be my mental health, and obviously that is a big piece of it. Um, but just in terms of Siegelman Stable, I think 90% of my networking uh, to start with over the last eight years has come through the fitness world in New York. It's crazy, it's crazy. Well, we just talked about you hitting <laughs> uh, Tone House at 5, 5 a.m. this morning. That's right. Which, which honestly, I think is arguably the, the hardest workout class in New York City. I mean, shout out to Zoe and Tone House. Definitely the hardest workout, I think, in, man, in the country. Crazy. Yeah. I, I haven't been in a while. I told you I'll be joining you one of these mornings. I'm still yet to do that, but we'll those warm ups back. killed me. We'll push it back. We don't have to do the 5 a.m. Yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, a little early afternoon, yeah. late, early, uh, late morning. We'll I'm figure in. it out. <laughs> um, all right. So, listen, during the pandemic, I mean, people were picking up uh, gardening and, uh, you know, they were buying puzzles and, you know, uh, finding little hobbies here and there to, to, to kind of pick up, um, you know, during their boredom and, and you know, when, with the world upside down. But you decided to, to go ahead and launch and launch a brand and start this thing up. Um, do you remember that moment where you kind of said, all right, I'm going to take this and actually see what we can do here? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't set out to be like, oh, I'm going to start a brand. I actually don't even know if I ever said exactly how it started mm -hmm. other than I started doing it for fun. Right. It actually started because I pa started painting all white sneakers. Okay. Uh, and I was like, let me paint. I don't know what I was doing. I was like at a homie's apartment who lived across the street, not supposed to go anywhere. So I went across the street, ordered a bunch of pair of white sneakers and started painting them. And I was like, let me do like a Siegelman stable themed one. And then it got me thinking. I was like, I posted on Instagram, and I was like, "Yo, those are dope. Can you paint shoes for me?" And I said, like, "I don't paint shoes." Like, I'm not. <laughs> so I like, I was like, "All right, I I haven't you." My dad is an actual racehorse trainer. Right. Uh, he started his own racing stable in the '80s, and my mom hand drew two logos for him when he first started. Yeah. So it's this logo, and then a bigger racing stable logo. So all I did for fun is I took 300 bucks, 400 bucks, made three different colorway hats three different colorway sweatshirts and just gave it to family and friends, like zero intention to sell it, mm. zero intention to have a website, try and grow it, anything. Uh, but once I gave it to some family and friends, they started wearing it. A lot more people started asking me for it. So I was like, all right, I'll get some more stuff. Gave it to some of them. And then I was like, let me start seeding it out to some people who I have somewhat of a relationship with from past work. Yeah. And before that I was doing creative and social and marketing um, strategy for some athletes and celebrities and music artists. Right. So seed it out to them, but it doesn't mean they're going to wear it. Uh, so if like a rapper like future probably gets a thousand different brands to send him stuff on a monthly basis, mm -hmm. doesn't mean he's going to wear every piece of it. Right. But little did I know four months later, he's gonna be wearing a hat in a music video. Unbelievable. So it's kind of been a crazy organic growth and still to this day, we haven't spent any money in marketing yeah. zero. I, um, I so can't yeah, that, so, man. Pandemic for me was like, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to do this. I want to start a brand. I want to be in fashion. It was like, I'm just going to take a heritage story that my dad created, mm -hmm. make some 
hats and sweatshirts for family and friends and it slowly and continues to slowly organically evolve into this life of its own yeah yeah incredible man uh, it's that's it's awesome what is your uh what do your parents think of this whole thing today i mean yeah. uh are they involved to any degree or, or do, are they letting you just do your thing and and you know how proud of them i can only imagine are they of you uh yeah i mean my dad calls himself the ceo the chief equine officer <laughs> um i think like he was also one of the people in the beginning was like who the fuck's gonna wear a seagull yeah. stable hat? well he's the og man he, I, I mean, mean he is he's, he's, stable. Yeah, right, his whole right. thing is like if you look at our storyboard or anything it's like all based off of his look and feel and crazy all of the, his story uh and we donate a portion of proceeds to equine therapy programs because he always opened up his racing stable to different equine therapy programs mm -hmm. um that. so that's a big ethos of our brand so I think like their involvement now, like they like to travel with us anywhere we go for projects, for shoots. Uh, they came to the Super Bowl. We yep. just got back, saw you out there. Yep. We did a thing there. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the beginning we were looking at, I was getting like contracts and like opportunities sent to us. And my mom worked uh, at ESPN and ABC Sports for like 45 years doing rights and clearance. Wow. So I had her looking at contracts. We did a collab with Muhammad Ali. She plugged us with ESPN to get uh, legit Ali footage or old Ali footage that we can use in some of our uh, of our campaign. So they stay they stay in tune. Crazy. They're in it. I love that. I love that. So it's really I mean, it is it is a family it's brand family business. It really is a family. I mean, the heritage and kind of the story behind the story is is, is yeah. special. It's uh, real. I mean, I think that's what helped us also break through because I think in the pandemic and just now it's it's a lot of people say oh, it's the hardest time to, to start a brand. Right. I actually think it's the easiest time to start a brand. And I'm not saying it's easy. It's not easy. It's the easiest time to just be like, okay, I'm going to sell a shirt mm -hmm. or I'm going to sell a hat with my brand on it. Right. So if you're a, a content creator, you can have a brand tomorrow because you have a following, you have a built-in customer base already. I didn't have any of that. Right. I just started telling a story and luckily started getting it to the right people, telling the right story and making that connection and building a community. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think that's why you've had so much... Uh, success organically, right? Because that story resonates with so many people. I mean, even for me, like the stable, uh, you guys are from Long Island, right? The fa your from family, Island, uh, yeah. right? You, so you grew up in- uh, Grew up in Nassau County, Nassau Long County, Island, yeah. yep. And the stable is still, is still there. The st stable itself was actually at the Meadowlands in New Jersey okay. for the majority of my life. Right. And then uh, in the off season of racing, they moved the horses more south to Freehold, New Jersey. Okay. So those were like the two main places. And then now my dad's retired, manages a few horses, but doesn't have to be there, uh, puts 99% of his time into equine therapy. Mm -hmm. So he spends it at Horse Ability, which is on Long Island, uh, on in Old Westbury, right. where he, like I said, spends a ton of his time doing equine therapy programs for kids with special needs, veterans, et cetera. Love that. Shout out Pops, man. Did, did you ever have any, uh, uh, did you ever ride? I mean, was that ever a goal of yours or a dream of yours as a kid? I mean, watching Pops and kind of knowing the story, was that ever a thing for you? It was definitely never like an ask like, oh, I'm going to be a racehorse trainer yeah. and driver myself. No, I think, and when I get asked this, I get asked a lot. It's like, I think I thought it was really cool because no one else's dad did it. Yeah. I don't think I fully understand the concept and the business and all of it until I really started this. So until I was 20 three, how old am I? I don't even know. Until I was 28 years <laughs> yeah, old yeah. when I started this. Uh, so I think like I had an opportunity to see horses and be around horses and go to the races and go to work with him super early in the morning. Maybe that's why I get up at 4 a.m. to work out because mm -hmm. he would literally leave at 4 a.m. to drive to Jersey to train these horses in the morning. Crazy. Um, so I think it was just, it was different. It was a cool opportunity. I don't think I really understood it and felt it until I started this. Right. Um, and then just continuing to learn about the industry and the people in it and the horse community on all different levels. Yeah, unbelievable. I, I, Pops must have been a superstar coming to uh, career day at, at school. I mean, now he, go, he goes to the track. He's <laughs> yeah. dimples to dimples. Oh, smile. Man, I, mean. I could imagine. I could imagine. <laughs> I love that. Um, you mentioned future wearing the hat. I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, future, Kendall Jenner, uh, Post Malone. I mean, uh, Chris Paul. I mean, it, it's it's crazy. And to think, again, just organically, um, you know, everybody getting their hands on, on, on the gear and particularly the hat, right? Um, What's that felt like, you know, for you just kind of sitting back and watching it really spread like rapid fire and, you know, really these amazing athletes and celebrities rocking, rocking your stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's it's sick. It's it's definitely like validating. Right. right. So I think when Future was one of the first two to wear it, it was like 
It wasn't like an I made it moment. It was Future like, was the f was one of the first ones. Uh, he was the second. Okay. Gunna was the first to wear it. It okay. wasn't a hat. It was a sweatshirt. Wow. Okay. And that was when I was literally making like gilded blanks and like screen printing it. Wow. So like he was like it was a picture was him in the in the sweatshirt that cost me probably seven fifty to make and then <laughs> maybe a little bit more. There was a, there was a tag in it. Uh, and then like a pair of leather pants, it was probably 4,500 bucks. Wow. Uh, and I was like, this is hilarious. And then a week later, future with a hat and a music video. So I think, I think it wasn't like a, oh, I made it moment. It's like, oh, I'm doing something right yeah. here. There's something to this. So it was like, let's see what else we can do. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, any time that any one of that caliber, uh, wears it, it it's validating, but I'll, um, more so it's, it's, it's a huge help as a brand that's fully e -com to build a community of someone who wants to buy a piece that they can't touch and feel and try on in person, mm. uh, which is also an emphasis for us to start doing more activations and pop-ups and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a culmination of 10 years of working in quote unquote, the entertainment industry on different levels and maintaining relationships and doing work for free. If someone asks for help or something, making a connection to someone else, uh, keeping your phone on loud at 3 a.m. if yeah. someone's working on a project in Egypt and you're like, oh, I can't miss this call right, in case right. they call me. Um, like stuff like that and keeping your network alive. Like I always say, I try and talk to 150 people a day, whether yeah. it's text, email, phone call, whatever. Today's definitely, I didn't get there, but That's they're right, still man. young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we, got, we got some time. But I, I literally do try and talk to as many people as I do possibly, even if it's just like, yo, what's good? Yeah. Like, that's it. I love that. I mean, I actually take pride in my networking skills. I mean, that's really how I've had any success in my own career. Um, but you, you, you're giving me a run for my money, honestly. And I don't know if I'm trying to keep you close because, uh, you know, I see you just running laps around me. <laughs> but, but I give you a lot of props because I know firsthand how, you know, how far just pinging somebody can go. I mean... Even for me, you know, one of my first gigs uh, uh, doing, I was doing divorce court. I was the bailiff and the court reporter on, on one of the court shows. And seen pictures. I got that gig. I got that <laughs> gig from so, somebody I met five, six years prior. Mm. Um, but I always stayed on top of everybody. And I always, you know, this is a Christmas gift or, you know, let's grab a coffee or let's, let's just, you know, send a note. And, and that goes mm -hmm. a long way. So I, I, know, um, I know exactly what you're talking about and, and how instrumental that is in, in building a brand, whether that be, you know, personally or have a clothing line whatever it is um that's the key in any industry i truly believe that yeah uh, and doing those that. small things along the way for those people you yeah. don't know where they're gonna end up you don't know where you're gonna end up and all of a sudden i did those things and then i finally had my own thing yeah and that's when you go to them and you're not asking them like hey yo i'm gonna send you this post it you're just like doing it naturally yep. just getting it out there yep. uh, and hope something happens yeah yeah i mean you're you're uh, living proof of, of that kind of uh, uh taking place man so um yeah, and it's just the beginning for you. I know it. I know it. Just warming um, up. Just warming up. Exactly. Yeah, that's your thing, right? You're just warming up. Just it's scratching the up. surface. I mean, really, it is crazy. It's only been, what, three, three, it's four years? It's three only years? been three years. Yeah. To think oh, of yeah, I guess we're into year four. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I always say we're just warming up, and I, like, say it kiddingly, but, like, we're not. Yeah. Like, we're just now getting to our ready-to-wear, yeah. getting beyond our basics, yeah. I think. A lot of brands start how we started, where yeah. it's you're using blanks, you're printing on it, you're embroidering them on it. Now we're we've been full cut and sew for the last six months, six plus months, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a huge transition. And now we're going into adding uh, ready to wear pieces and higher fashion, higher end fashion pieces uh, and non clothing pieces. Mm -hmm. So I think you start to see the evolution of the brand and where you see it going. I mm -hmm. uh, don't take full credit for that, as you know, my my better half uh, as creative director. Um, but it's definitely a, an evolution and it's definitely, if you do things right and organic, it does take time to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to throw a few more names in the mix. Um, <laughs> did I say Kendall Jenner? Cause you know, that's my girl. So you I say you, you wore it. Uh, Ken, uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> hey, Nikki B, Nikki B was wrong. You know, uh, no, but I remember, I think the first time I'm, or, or I saw it kind of hit that mainstream was Kendall Jenner was wearing it in, uh, was it a Vogue shoot or something? Yeah, she wore um, Paris Fashion Week right. to the Off-White show, and it just so happened she dyed her hair red, I think it was, for the Prada show. Okay. So, like, all the pictures and paparazzi was focused on her hair color, which benefited us. Of course. And that little story of that is, like, I made a dozen of that color hat, and I was like, nah, I'm not messing with that color. Yeah. And I seeded it out to, like, five people, um, and literally two days after I sent it to L.A. to her, it ended up in Paris somehow wow. on her head. And that picture, I mean, it continues to circulate as like an inspo pick in yeah. Vogue and everything. I see it all the time. Yeah. Uh, so you so you did send it to her and her team? 
or C, yeah, it was okay. CBC did it to her. So like, there's kind I, of a story behind each. I mean, there's a strategy to how yeah. we do it, and I think a lot of people think like, oh, see who Sable must see a hundred people a month. Like, mm -hmm. I could probably name all twenty people we've ever seen it. Yeah, like that's it. Crazy. Um, and we get now people ask us to to get a piece to wear to an event and this and that, and and we sometimes do it if it's right alignment. But when we first started, I had two lists of those influential type of people on the aspirational side and the relatable side. Mm -hmm. Future would fall on the aspirational side, meaning his community and his audiences following are inner city kids. He's from Atlanta, maybe never had the opportunity to go to a horse race, ride a horse, be in front of a horse, uh, and that's aspirational to them. Right. But you look at Kendall Jenner or a Hadid sister and they grew up around horses. Uh, Kendall, I think, spoke on, um, I forget what interview she did, um, but she talks about her love for horses and equine therapy. Wow. So there's obviously all of that alignment there yeah. and fashion. Yeah. Um, so I think that's how we see it. And we like to see ourselves as a brand that can hit both of those audiences mm -hmm. that can be part of all of those different pieces of culture. Right. Um, that's incredible. Uh, I, I love that. Um, Aaron Judge is somebody who I want to throw in the mix, too, because <laughs> I think, you know, you and I spoke about him and kind of how he's been backing you since since the early days. Yeah. Uh, was it his wife that I, I read <clears throat> that he she reached out or what was what was the story behind Aaron Judge because I see him now rocking that all the time. I mean he's he's yeah. sitting there rocking a hat while you're running the New York City Marathon back and you up there. It's funny the two times I've ever seen him in person is at the finish line of the New York City Marathon waiting for Sam his wife, um, who this year we're actually running for the same organization. Amazing. I think she wants to run a little bit faster than I do, <laughs> but I think I'm gonna go for it. Yeah. Uh, is at the finish line. I'm obviously wearing a Seaman Sable hat and he is and we have the same interaction. For both years in a row so i'm like i feel like this is a family tradition yeah, we're doing yeah. here um but no i mean his, sam and, and aaron have been supporters of seagullman stable uh and i'm close with the new yorker nowhere founders mm -hmm. uh and they're big supporters of new yorker nowhere and that was one of the reasons that we even started talking as two brands to do a project together yeah um so uh yeah i mean they're just good people yeah. who support businesses from new york because uh, they're now New Yorkers for life. Yep, yep. Um, and obviously Aaron wearing the hat. I mean, we've made waves in the MLB and baseball like I never even thought about. It's so unreal. Yeah. And just, just more dot connecting there, just another example. That's it. Just keep networking. Who would be one person, if you could choose in the entertainment space, that hasn't gotten their hands on some, some gear yet that you'd want to represent the brand? I don't think there's one individual. I think it's someone who would align with the brand on all sides, uh, being fashion, uh, the charitable aspect of equine therapy, um, and just um, like we want to do a runway show in the next few years. Like we want to be able to uh, put out four seasons on a runway show, being able to see um, really what we're working on and where we see the vision mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I could probably name. 30 people, but I can't name one. Well, I, well, Kendall Jenner would be a, a great, right? I mean, Kendall, because she kind Kendall of be fits good. the mold to be that model she's on the a, runway. She's a horse girl. Yeah. She uh, uses equine therapy as a form of therapy, uh, rides horses. So, yeah, yeah. she obviously would be great. Yeah. All right. We'll take that. We'll take that. We'll, 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 we'll circle back we'll bring to that back. one. Yeah. Um, I guess I could ask you this, too, then. I'm not sure if you'll have an answer, but was there one, aside from Future and Gunna and some of the early um, – uh, you know, celebrities that, that were, were uh, rocking, rocking your hats and, and gear. Um, was there one that you said, ah, oh, shit, like, this is actually, this is a really special moment. Like maybe someone you idolized growing up or someone, you know, you're just a huge fan of. Was there one that stood out just for the little, ki the little kid in you more so than, than the others? Yeah, I mean, the future one, obviously the best, yeah. or not the best, but the coolest, because it was one of the first. And when I started this, all I was doing was like playing future music videos in my studio Crazy. apartment in Williamsburg. Crazy. Uh, but, um, and I've recently become super close with him, I'm about to say, uh, and I played soccer and I was a goalie growing up. Um, but when I, when I got a DM from Tim Howard, wow. and it was like, yo, I fuck with your brand, basically. Love that. Um, That's a good one. It was one. sick. Yeah. And in the last year, Tim and I become close friends, uh, go to dinner together, talk about anything and everything. Crazy. Usually nothing to do with work. Yeah, I mean, he's always interested in like what we're doing as a brand. I always obviously ask him how he's at NBC Sports now. Mm -hmm. um, but like just... Uh, an amazing dude and as a as a kid who played goalie his entire life yeah. and watched Tim play 
in the English Premier League, come back to the MLS, play in World Cups, like special, really special. Yeah, I love yeah. that. I love and that. a New Jersey guy. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. That's that's great. I love yeah. that. It's a good answer. Um, uh, you mentioned your better half. I want to dive into this a little bit because you got a small team here. I mean, <laughs> it's a very small team. Small team. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, your uh, fiance. Uh, you mentioned creative director, and she's obviously hands-on day to day. I mean, you guys yeah. are uh, uh, quite the the, the duo. Um, how special is it to have her a part of this and, and to be able to build this thing out with you? I also got to ask, do you guys run into any difficulties kind of being, you know, uh, in, in a relationship and being able, you know, not having that separation yeah. and kind of being together 24-7? No, we're pretty good at that. Yeah. Uh, I'd say the, the, bit, the hardest part of that is like when you go home and you're like trying to talk about work and right. you start talking about work, yeah. but we're, we're working on it. Um, but no, I mean, it's been Caroline and I, I started Seagull and Stable maybe six months before I met Caroline. Mm. Uh, when we first met, I said, hey, I don't want you to get involved. Three weeks later, she's running the shit. Wow. Uh, but we... That's when you knew. You're like, ah, oh, this is, yeah, this is like, the, one. the one. Yeah, the <laughs> one. But um, she's so good at what she's so good at. And I'm good at what I'm good at. And it's so different that it works. Mm. Um, her vision, her aesthetic, her background in fashion, all of that stuff um, is what you see put out. Mm -hmm. uh, our campaigns, our shoots, our products, um, our future ready to wear, which is like really where we see it going and really what she's uh, dove into head first. Um, but for the first three years of this, it was literally just us Crazy. Uh, packing boxes from my studio apartment. Then we moved in together, finally forced each other to get an office across the street from our apartment so we can kind of separate work and, and uh, home life. Uh, and then finally this year, literally just a month or two ago, hired our first employee. Um, so we still do our own fulfillment. We have one employee uh, other than the two of us um, and great help from consultants uh, along the way in different departments of this business. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're definitely at a, a growth point, but also trying to keep the team as small as possible yeah. because at the end of the day, we're all hands on with everything that goes into this. Yeah. Um, and and I know that's very important for you to kind of be hands on. I know you spent a lot of time at the factory. You're back and forth to L.A. I mean, you've been yeah. there how many times the last couple of months? We're going on um, uh, trip five next week. Crazy. Back to LA. Crazy. Yeah. What what is, a, a, I guess, a normal day for you, you guys? Um, here at the office or just, you know, obviously running a brand like this. I mean, um, how much time are you at the factories? How often are you overseeing the fabrics and how, you know, run me through kind of a day where, um, where you're just kind of in and out of the factories and yeah. the office space. Um, no day is the same. Yeah. That's for sure. Uh, fabric we're hands on. We pick everything out. We order it all from this office that you're sitting in. Mm. Um, we do all of our headwear in New York. We do all of our other pieces, clothing, jackets, sweatshirts, all that good stuff um, in LA, mm. uh, which is why we go out there pretty often. Um, we have a really big focus on sustainability. So we use all organic materials, uh, upcycled, recycled materials. Uh, the brims of every hat you see is 100% recycled material. Um, where we're small enough as a brand now to focus on it and mm -hmm. make sure we're doing it right. So when we do continue to grow, um, we can continue installing those things that we've done early on. And I think it's a lot harder as bigger brands trying to go backwards and figure out how to redo them to be more sustainable. Um, and that again comes from Caroline. She's from Norway. They education is much greater than ours on sustainability. Um, whereas I knew it, thought about it, didn't do much about it. And then she gets involved and it's a lot more at the top of the list of importance for us, right. which it should be. Right. Um, so yeah, I think a, a normal day, no such thing, but, uh, we like to split up the week or we try to where it's, we're focusing on what's in development now and what's coming now and what's coming. And then the second half of the week, what's coming in the next six months, 12 okay. months, where we've always started to, uh, we've never been able to plan six, 12, 18 months ahead. We're now finally at the point where we're planning 12, 18 months ahead 
Um, which I mean, I, see, I, I saw the, yeah. the whiteboard in there, man. It's, yeah. it's crazy. Well, you uh, missed it yesterday. It should have been here yesterday. <laughs> my, that's basically just my brain yesterday uh, writing on that whiteboard, which was scary for everyone in here Unreal. yesterday. No, I, I saw you post that, and I'm like, man, this, this guy's <laughs> a beast, man. He's a beast. Um, for anybody listening that, that wants to start a streetwear brand, I know it's hard to narrow it down on one piece of advice, but mm -hmm. what's something you would tell them um, how to get started, what characteristics someone would need to kind of break through? Um, what would you say to a listener that's, that's like, man, I want to be like that guy? I don't know if you want to be like that guy, but <laughs> uh, I think there's a few things. I mean, one, there's no blueprint how to do it. I think you got to pick pieces of what you've seen people do that's worked for them and figure out how to make it work for you. Um, when we first started, that's kind of what I did. I looked at different brands that I thought we could try to be like, um, and figured out what they were doing that made sense that we could mimic in a way to work for us. Mm -hmm. And I think that worked for us then. And now I look at other brands and then in six months I'll look at other brands and you just have to evolve with where you're at as a business. I think that's important. I think the other piece that it's, oh, the important piece of that is like, there is no blueprint, like create your own blueprint but utilize what you've seen work other places right. to help you draw yours. Um, I think the other piece is having a real story and a purpose. We're lucky where we do have a real story and my dad as a horse trainer and um, the equine therapy piece as the purpose. Uh, so I think having a purpose, having a story, staying true to it and telling it in different ways with different partners through your own capsules, through collaborations, is how you stay consistent and break through all of the clutter of other quote unquote brands just starting. Love that. Love that. Um, is there a brand that sticks out to you that, um, that you were truly inspired from growing up? I mean, you really don't have any fashion experience prior to, you know, the pandemic, I'm or little, good. little to none, Try right? Look good. <laughs> yeah, no, you look great, man. You know, come on. I don't got to say that, but, but this is all kind of new for you, right? When you started this thing up, w w was there, you know, what was your biggest or who was your biggest fashion inspiration looking back now? And, and even if you didn't realize like, man, I was taking notes from that guy all this time. Yeah. I mean, I, I consulted in my life before this, uh, for a few people who were part music, part fashion, just creatives. Um, and tried to pick up things or picked up things I didn't realize before I started this and thought back on it. And I think some of those things helped. Yeah. Um, I uh, consulted a little bit on a few projects with Virgil and obviously wow. I don't think you can name a better person to, even if you're in a room with him for 30 seconds, pick up some stuff and learn from. Um, but I think you just look at uh, the evolution of fashion from when I was a kid in the 90s to where fashion's at now. Mm -hmm. I think I've watched like the Ralph Lauren documentary a gajillion times. Yeah. And like, if you look at that, like he had no background in fashion. He was just like, I'm going to make this tie for the everyday person. And then it evolved to what it is now. And along that journey, he started uh, Polo Sport, which was strictly, it was literally a streetwear company within yeah. Polo. Uh, and he targeted hip hop artists. He had Diddy wearing it. He had all of these New York City rap artists. Yeah wearing it in Times Square, going to the music studio, going crazy, wearing just like polo. And I, that's like, in my head, when I first started this, I'm like, that's kind of how I feel like I need to start this. Right. And I had a lot of good relationships in the hip hop world. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of what I looked at. Right. Um, so I think that there's, like I said, like as you evolve as a brand and you're at different steps along the journey of the brand, you can look back in history at different brands and you can look now at what's, what's working for brands and try and curate different things from them to make it work for what you are trying to achieve. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, man, listen, I'm learning. Uh, listen, if I, I got to watch this, uh, this episode back when I'm ready to <laughs> launch my, uh, my, my streetwear brand, but no, it's incredible, man. You've done some amazing things. And, and again, to think that it's just been a few years is, 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 um, even that much sweeter. Um, the man behind the brand just will wrap this up. I mean, um, we spoke about, health and wellness and fitness playing a huge role in your life. What's some other things that, that you feel like people don't know about you? I mean, I feel like I've gotten to know you a bit now over the, the, the last, uh, you know, several months. Um, what, what are some things uh, that you could share that maybe people don't know about you? I'd rather stay home and watch a movie than be out till <laughs> two in the morning. Uh, I think a lot of people look at you through Instagram these days or mm -hmm. through social and think because you are in a picture with this person or that person, like, 
you're in that scene and that's what you're doing. Meanwhile, I'd literally rather be in bed at 8.30 watching a movie and cooking dinner. Watching the Ralph Lauren doc. Whatever it is, yeah. I'd rather be doing that. Yeah. Like I watched the Kid Leroy documentary last night. Um, I didn't get to bed early enough to wake up at 4 a.m. to work <laughs> out, but still got up. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I just keep a tight circle. I mean, I keep a big network, but I keep a tight circle. Yeah. That's probably how I would summarize how I kind of live my life. How you operate, I love that, yeah. yeah. All right, man. Well, there you have it. Uh, Mr. Max Hugelman, I appreciate it. Thank uh, you for this coming. was a pleasure. Thank you for having us. And like we always say, here's to life. <laughs>